A growing number of companies around the world are looking at climate change and sustainability. They've integrated that into their corporate strategies. They're reporting uh, internationally on the efforts that they're making. So I really am seeing a growing interest. Now, of course, you are uh, an advisor to uh, many companies now who are looking to change their uh, approach to environment, the environmental uh, footprint. Are you seeing them really taking this to board level and starting to tie perhaps remuneration uh, towards uh, mitigating their carbon footprint? Yes, in fact, I'm finding that a growing number of CEOs around the world really are putting climate and sustainability on the boardroom agenda, integrating it into their business strategies, and also linking performance to that. In other words, asking of their managers, asking of their staff members that they perform in relation to environmental issues and that their reward be determined accordingly. When we talk about uh, the carrot and the stick approach, there's a lot of debate around uh, how you get people to make meaningful uh, change. When you're looking at it from, it from a global perspective, are the territories where we see emissions caps and where we see carbon taxes uh, creating the, the momentum, increased momentum uh, towards driving change, is that the necessary approach? Do we need that stick approach to really start seeing meaningful action from companies? I don't think I would actually describe that as a, as a stick approach in the sense that if I talk to CEOs around the world, the thing that I hear them asking for most is long-term predictability and ambition from government. In fact, the worst thing that you can have as a business is a lack of clarity on where the politicians intend to take a subject like climate change. So in fact, the business community is asking for ambition. So really they need that uh, certainty really in order to uh, form their new strategies. Of course you were the uh, UN FCCC Executive Secretary from 2006 to 2010. Let's focus in on COP17 so far. Just speaking to a Green a Peace a leader from Canada, they're saying Can Canadians are really embarrassed about the obstinate stance the government there is taking. They're really joining the USA uh, in really their position with regards to Kyoto and a legally binding global agreement. What are your views on the type of calls that we see? seen from the USA and Canada? Well, the Canadian economy is very intimately linked to the economy of the United States. In fact, you could almost say that it's one economy. And it's made it really difficult in the past that Canada is part of the Kyoto Protocol and the United States is not, which is why Canada is, is calling for a global approach that embraces all countries. And I think for multiple reasons, beyond the case of Canada alone, that makes an awful lot of sense. Listening to Todd Stern, who's the lead negotiator for the USA, he was saying that they won't commit to anything legal on the basis that they don't know who else is going to commit and on what terms. I mean, playing devil's advocate, surely that's fair enough. They really have been cited as kind of the, uh, the, the, the people who are obstinate and trying to hold up negotiations. I think we're way past the point where we should be pointing fingers at each other. I mean, one of the things that disappoints me about the process at this moment in time is that so many countries here are talking about what other countries need to be doing as opposed to what they're going to be doing themselves. So I really think we need to, to see come out of Durban a process where, whereby we begin to determine what each and every country around the world is going to do to address climate change. The, many are saying that China and India should agree to uh, something legal uh, and should agree to reduce their own emissions. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you agree that China, who is now on par with the USA, should make some meaningful uh, uh, legally binding agreement in order to reduce its own emissions? Well, China is on a par with the United States in terms of the size of the economy, but not in terms of the welfare of the people. There are still an awful lot of poor people in China, uh, and many of those poor people in China are actually producing products for people in industrialized countries. So you could ask yourself, are the polluters really the Chinese, or are they the consumers in, uh, in industrialized countries? But I do actually see China and India actually taking action at home right now to address climate change. We talk about uh, institutions and bodies like the Carbon War Room really creating those market mechanisms um, and really taking on uh, climate change and reducing emissions uh, into a financial uh, viewpoint and, and filling that gap where there isn't that market mechanism. Do you think that's really the future and where we're going to see meaningful reduction in emissions? I think it's a, an important part of the future. For example, recently a number of consumer goods companies decided that in the future they will only sustainably source beef, soy and palm oil, which are the main drivers of deforestation. And that is exactly, I think, the kind of action that the private sector can take, even though clear policies are not in place. But at the end of the day, you need leadership from people that were elected to lead.
Ivo, just uh, quickly before we go, what are your views on COP17 so far? Uh, of course, we're likely to, uh, we very many questioning whether we're going to see a second commitment of a Kyoto Protocol. What are your views on that? And just to describe what the next two days are likely to be like uh, for those who haven't attended uh, a COP before. Well, to start with the latter part of your question, I think the next two days are going to be six days in the sense that people are going to be negotiating around the clock in order to come to an outcome here in Durban because that's what people absolutely want. People want to see a successful outcome of this conference and not to see the process uh, slide into, into inaction. So that's what people are working really hard towards. I think it is foreseeable that we get a continuation of the Kyoto Protocol, but only if it's in the context of a broader agreement to move towards a treaty, a process that addresses all countries.